Yeah, we're good. Okay, so we are getting into the very last topic that uh, we've been talking about, and this is future. Um, it was interesting whenever we decided, when we were talking, and Angie and I were kind of talking about what topics we should put into this course, every one of the topics were all about growing, um, you know, growing wisdom about some area, learning more about God, like all these different things were all about stuff that was applicable to our lives. And uh, and then when we put future in there, which we, it, it was, what I found interesting was we popped that on there and we, we both felt very comfortable. We, we felt like we needed to have that in there, but it was weird because it wasn't, it didn't seem like it was applicable. It wasn't something that you apply to your life as much. Although I think there are some things in there that you do apply. It was more about, you know, the future. And um, so the more that we studied it, the more I looked into it, the more that I started to see, though, it, it, it really is a critical component to understanding, you know, there's a lot, a lot in the Bible about the future. And so it's something that we can't just like let go and discard. And the more I got into it, the more I started to see, and it's like, yeah, I think there's some, there's some, there's a lot of reasons to why God feels that this is a necessary component. Um, so let's start with uh, the, the study, if you hear the term eschatology, that's what, the, that's what it means, it's the study of future events. Um, inside of the Bible there's a, a lot of different um, prophecies that are written in the Old Testament, I mean, tons of prophecies about Jesus coming back, for example, um, all those we've actually seen, but there's also a ton of prophecy that hasn't happened yet today. And, you know, if you think about it, you've got, like, um, Daniel is a really large chunk of scripture talking about future pro prophecy. The um, book of Revelation is another really large deposit of it. You'll see as we go through here, there's also, it's splattered through the Gospels. Jesus frequently talked about it. As a matter of fact, I, I found this interesting. But on Wednesday, I was studying my men's group in, in Luke chapter 23 or something like that. And Jesus, like when he was in the middle of getting crucified, like when he was carrying his cross. Let me read it real quick. I was just, I was like, wow. It says, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think it's Luke chapter 23. Basically, he's carrying this cross, and then um, I guess he collapsed. And so then this guy, Simon from Cyrene, comes up, and they make him carry the cross. And um, a large, it says a large crowd, verse 27, a large crowd traveled behind, including many grief-stricken women. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. And this is the part. For your children, for the days are coming when they will... When they will say, fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, and wombs that have not borne a child, the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? But that's like, that's like a, if you, when you start reading about end times and prophecy that occurred after the time that Jesus was on earth, this is talking about some of that stuff, you know. When you hear about the, the Great Tribulation, it talks about how, you know, you, you women are going to wish they didn't have, they weren't nursing and fleeing to the hills and all that stuff. But it just found it interesting. It's like it really is splattered throughout. When you start to look for it, it's interesting how much you find prophecy and discussion about the future um, throughout the Bible. So 2 Timothy, we've heard this before, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so that's the reason why I feel it's so necessary to go through and understand even the future prophecies in the Bible. Um, I, I, I point that out a lot because 
I think a lot of the, I think you get people falling into two camps in general when it comes to Revelation in particular. Some people will say it's too confusing, I don't understand it, there's enough of the other Bible, I don't ever have to touch it. And then other people get like so steeped up in to end times related stuff that it's like their whole world is just that. And there's a I think to understand any part of scripture to to the best knowledge possible is always a good thing, so I can't fault this, but this side I have to fault because again, God gave this to us. Why to give it to us? You know, there's there's a purpose behind it. And we've got to try to understand just like we understand all the other parts of the Bible. Well it says blessed are those that read that. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, why I read Revelation. It sometimes when I don't understand it. So, yeah. Because he says blessed are those. Um, so another thing is that uh, really important is that when we read Revelation and we read these prophecy things, or even that part right there where I was just talking about what Jesus said when he was um, about to be crucified, he was in the process of, uh, we got to realize that every bit of what's written in the Bible is 100% true. We've studied that before. 100% accurate, no, no mistakes or anything. But our interpretation of things are definitely subject to flaws. And we got to realize that, especially when you get into prophecy. So, why is that so important? Just like every other part of the Bible, in order for us to be able to understand it fully, we really got to listen to the Holy Spirit. And we really got to, um, I've heard it said before, but um, I don't remember where I heard it, but I've heard it said a number of times. When you think about prophecy and your understanding of prophecy, you always need to kind of like hold on to that with open hands, your understanding. In other words, okay, this is how I understand it today. And you need to kind of think that way. Because you may or may not fully understand what's going on in that. And you may or may not. That I, f I think that uh, the more you dig in, the more the Holy Spirit reveals to you, the more scriptures you read, the more and more you're your understanding starts to refine, but it's based off a of certain beliefs and assumptions that you have. So that's one thing as we're getting into this is kind of always hold on to it in kind of a light sense, what your understanding is of the end times. So there you go. Okay. Um, the other thing is about future prophecy, especially when you get into Revelation and Daniel. I mean, Daniel constantly were talking about different horns and stuff like that. And these horns represent kingdoms. So, there's very colorful world, words that are kind of splattered throughout the Bible. Um, but especially when you get into prophecy, because you got these people that are seeing things that, my guess is, they can't even relate to them in their yeah. time period. You know, like what would... Well, if you think about it, go back to biblical times before there was any concept of, I mean, the most probably technological and technologically advanced thing was like a chariot or something like that. You know, I mean, it, imagine if back from that time, if that was your whole world, and all of a sudden you see a uh, um, fighter pilot, you know, flying a jet across the sky. Like, what in order are you going to think? You know, or you see a bomb go off. Like, what's that going to be like? Or, I mean, just you see what I'm saying? So, they have a lot of colorful words. They've done their best to try to describe in the Bible what is going on. But you got to realize, you've got to think, when you're thinking about what could potentially happen, you got to kind of start to play out what could be, what could this be talking about? Um, you know, there's one scripture that talks about uh, the rocks crying out, yeah. for example. You know, does that mean that the physical rocks are crying out? Or, um, you know, like, if you look at what, um, how we record audio before digital, you know, like on tape recorders and discs and things like that, that's chromium oxide. That's like, that's like little uh, metal chunks on there that you're moving around, you know, and you're giving yourself a little, like a path that essentially when it plays through a recorder, generates audio. So, like, could it be that that's what that is, the rock's crying out? See what I'm saying? Yeah. So, keep that in mind. Um, and I got a couple examples of, of stuff like that, so 
I, these aren't necessarily directly scripture references, but what if we had, if they said there was a beast and it was covered in eyes all from head to toe? Okay, if that's, if that's something that the scripture says, well, maybe, that, maybe what he was visualizing was that somebody could see everywhere. And if you could see everywhere, like in today's time, that doesn't totally surprise us. You know, with computers, cameras, all the different surveillance and stuff like that. It makes sense that you could see all the way around you all the time. And, you know, back when, when we were kids, mom's got eyes in the back of her head, you know. <laughs> like today, they might have, <laughs> you know. Might have a little camera implanted or something, but you never know. So. I have a, I've always, I've thought about that because I think I've heard someone kind of preach on that one time about the, how we view what the, they're looking at. I don't know, so, some, I, something just sticks in my head when I was talking about that had a scorpion in its tail. This scorpion in its tail, and I'm thinking, you know, all the different warfare things we have now could very well be something that that, you know, if they've seen one of them, right. they could think that, you know. Right. So I think a lot of those are things that we see, but they they just tell them not their words, you know. Yeah, like if they were to say, like a bird breathing flames, right. could it be a fighter shooting missiles or something like that? You know, just keep that in mind, I guess, more than anything, as we're talking about prophecy. Think about when they start, especially when they start using the weird word, words and stuff like that, so you're thinking about, well, they, they're trying to describe something. So it may not be exactly an animal, you know, a particular animal. Well, we've seen some parts of Daniel's prophecy actually come to play over history. And it's like we know that these horns are, can are, but if you read, you know, this big statue and being made of different things, we can start to see kind of in history how some of this kind of played out. And, and you can start to see, okay, well, that's what they were seeing or that's what they were referring to. Or that was the image they heard in order to be able to put these words on paper. So I'm kind of curious about how do you guys generally, I'd just like to take a poll of the room. How have you guys traditionally thought about prophecy? in time prophecy, our futuristic events and things like that. What's been your position before today? To read as much about it as I can. Okay, so you're a digger on it. Well, yeah. yeah. So you've, you've read a lot of, you've read all, like any scripture you know about it, you try to dig in to study it, do you typically read books, how do you go about that? I do a little bit of both. Okay. You know, if it says it in the book, then I want to see it here, so that I know what they're telling me is the straight sure. scoop yeah, yeah absolutely you know and uh, but do i read a little bit of fiction about it too yes i do i read all the left behind books yeah, you know same here. oh yeah because i thought they were so good interesting read. yeah they were very good read and they were pretty true to pretty true to farm what this says based upon what they thought what could that be right yeah you know yeah how about others Mine was just how I was raised, just from church, Baxter. Which was what? I mean, but describe that. Like, well, like you never thought about it except for when the teach, when the preacher preached it? Is that what you're saying? I mean, you are, when you're not living the right life, you always think about it like, am I going to make okay. it? Do you so know you, what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but I always took it as, um, there's going to be one tribulation, God's going to come back. And I guess it's a movie I had saw, I don't know if it was Left Behind or something, where somebody woke up and their whole family, and I remember when I was younger, and, you know, I do my own thing and stuff, and I called everyone in my family, and they did not answer the phone. And the first thing I thought was, wow, God came back and I'm here on this earth. It was kind of scary, but I mean, at the time of what I was doing, mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't ready, so, but it was more, I never really went in the, I really never read Revelations. I'm going to read a lot of it. I just watched a movie and then just always hearing the pastor, you know, I always said, okay, this, when God comes back, then I just pictured like the grave people going up and then, yeah. and literally I'm thinking I can see people just going to the sky, but when I watch a movie, they just was gone, but, um. Anyone else? I mean, I've read Revelation a okay. couple times and stuff, but um, I mean, I've listened to speakers too talk about, 
you know, the future. And, that. and I just, I listen to it, but then kind of reflect back on Revelation and stuff like that. Do you feel like you have kind of a picture of the timeline in your mind? Um, sort of? Or do you feel like it was more or not necessarily? Um, I don't have a particular picture. Okay. Like, no. Okay. Anyone else? When I think of prophecy, I think of either, obviously, we, I watched a little bit of the video from last week because it was in here about like either speaking the future tense mm -hmm. or you speak, you, or you speak like a message to someone. What I think is when someone speaks a message to someone, I think of prophecy is that I think it always has to tie back because God's not gonna God's not gonna speak to someone if it's not like in the Bible. So like if I would go up there up on church Sunday and prophesy like, oh like this is this is God's message to you. It's like completely a little bit against what this scripture says. Like it's obviously not like I'm not right. It's gonna be, <coughs> so you're never gonna say something from you're never gonna hear something from God that's contradictory to yeah God's yeah, word. It's always gonna be in line with yeah. Like I, everything that someone said to me about prophecy or like someone's like I had prophetic dreams like and someone interpreted or something like it's always been like okay like here's a verse for that too like so you're thinking more you're when you've thought about prophecy you think about it more in yeah. the sense of the prophetic gift. The gift of prophecy that's spoken yes. by the Corinthians. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyone else want to throw anything out there? Isn't Dan doesn't Daniel and Revelations aren't there a lot of things the same? They're mm -hmm. talking the same. Yeah. And there which to me is a lot of the future. But isn't that prophecy there different than what we had in the Old Testament? Old Testament always seems like they were warning or, or getting on the people. They were not listening to God. You know what I'm saying? A it lot, seemed like a different type of... Not, I mean, there's a lot of prophecy that's specifically to the Israelites. Is that, that's what you're referring to about the right, getting on? Right. Like a lot of Ezekiel and Jeremiah right. are specifically talking about, you know, you guys are going to do this and some Babylonians are going to come take you over and stuff like that. Um, but there's also, I mean, a lot of Old Testament prophecy that's completely futuristic. All of oh, Isaiah. yeah, I know. Well, Ezekiel has some of that, too. Yeah. Which I guess Daniel, is... Daniel, Isaiah, yeah. Ezekiel. So I think, yeah. I think God, um, I mean, he gives us prophecy all over the place yeah. about things, a lot of which have happened in the past, a lot of which are going to happen in the future, and I think it's splattered throughout. I think a lot of the Old Testament was focused in the history of the Israelites before it happened, because they weren't following God, and they were trying to warn them and get them to come away from their sin. But do you really believe that He gives us new future? I mean, why would He give us new future when He's already laid out? Beyond what's in the Bible, you mean? Yeah. Um, I don't think that's typically how the prophecy gift is working. Like okay, that's person why I, I guess I wanted yeah. to... Yeah, I don't think that's... I'm not going to say it's beyond what God could do because he, oh. he's got examples all over the Bible where he's done it. Mm -hmm. You know? So I won't say... I won't go that far, but I will say that it's more of the prophecy that we're experiencing in the gifts, I think, is more of a... A word for somebody or a personal mm -hmm, okay. uplifting, and that's kind of described that way in Corinthians a little bit. Okay. So, but I'm not going to say it's impossible for him to give anybody a future thing just because we see examples of it in the Bible. Okay. That's not kind of how I draw my conclusions. It's like if I see, I really hold on to see that whole open hand concept. It's like if if you were to say, I'll tell you a common one. Um, could God, um, could God reveal the gospel to somebody on a, an island with never having a human ever come to that island other than that person? You know, kind of like the Tom Hanks in the soccer ball I think. But like, could that happen? Yes. Is there any proof that that's happened in here? Not exactly. <laughs> so, so I hold that like real open-handed. You know, my conclusion is I'm not going to limit God. I think He's capable of anything. He probably could do that. Um, but I'm not sure going to go to war over it, right? Because it's like it's a belief that I have that's not heavily founded in Scripture. Okay. So, 
and I think with regard to prophecy, I, I, that's kind of in that thing. Can a person today say a, pro, a futuristic prof, prophetic thing? Seems like there's a number of different references in the scripture, so that makes me feel a little more secure in saying that, but it's still kind of open in my hand. So. Okay, well, let's jump into the, the timeline. So, we all know that the first coming of Christ, so you're going to hear a few terms first coming of Christ, second coming of Christ, end of age. I'm going to try to, I try to pull those terms together and give definition to those a little bit because you see them throughout the scripture a lot. And so, that's kind of what I'm trying to, when I'm talking about these different things, there seems to be a chronological order to these, but I will say there's some beliefs that some things are in backward, different orders of things as well. So, I'm just going to kind of present the facts to you, you guys kind of draw your conclusions out of it, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Okay? So, um, first coming though, that one's pretty locked in, that's historical. So we know uh, Jesus was born as a child, we know that he uh, lived about 33 years on earth, he was physically crucified, he died, he rose again three days later, and that is how we're all saved and reunited with God in the, in, the, in the now with the Holy Spirit living within us, and eventually we're going to get to go to heaven. Okay, he restored that, he restored the, the bridge over that big gap that we can jump. After he rose again, so after three days later, he rose again, he was, at, he was on the earth for 40 days. We talked about that. And after the 40 days, he sent the Holy Spirit to come um, to us. But I want to call attention to Acts chapter 1, verse 11. So hop to it real quick. Because it's, this is our first little glimpse about the future. Well, not, not first in the Bible, but for today. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. So Jesus basically, um, if we, actually if we just uh, back up to verse 9 for a minute. After saying this, so Jesus said something to him. He was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. So kind of, you know, mind we said in the movies a lot of times it's kind of disappeared. But, um, that's not what happened with Jesus. He was here, and he's like, I mean, Andrew just saw a rocket launch in Florida in his video a minute ago. He's like, Jesus was like, went up and disappeared into the clouds. They saw him do that. And verse 11, this is the one that I want to bring attention to. Um, two white-robed men, this is verse 10, as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them, Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Okay, there's a reference about, that's a, that's a reference there to say, just like you see him rising into the clouds, we're going to run across some other scripture that, you know, when he left, that, that first coming of Christ, it says that he's going to return in the same way. We are going to see him in the clouds. Okay, so that's that's the first kind of uh, jump into the future now. So now we're, we're 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 out of the history, and we're jumping into the future. And the future, the next event that that I want to talk about is the second coming of Christ. Now chronologically, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna draw the conclusion that the second coming is timing wise that the next big event is the second coming because we're going to talk about the great tribulation. And that's the, that lead that kind of is a lead into the second coming of Christ. But I want to talk about the second coming of Christ a little bit. I want to jump over some of that. We'll come back to that. I want to jump over that to the second coming of Christ and talk about some scriptures related to that. The biggest thing when I start, remember I was telling you at the beginning about terms. Second coming of Christ is talked about a bunch. End of age is not talked about a lot. But there is a scripture that ties end of age to the second coming of Christ. And that is um, Matthew 24, 3. I want to read that to you real quick. And then I want to come back to Matthew 13, which is one of the first uh, scriptures that talk about the second coming of Christ. 
So Matthew 24, 3, we'll go there first. Someone read that? I got it. Okay. Later Jesus said, you said 24, 3, right? Correct. Later Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when will when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return at and the end of the world? Okay, and in other translations it would say end of age. Okay. okay. So what I want to kind of point out here is is so they're talking about there's the when Jesus returns, because they're physically talking with him and if we keep right, if we keep reading through um, 24 verse 4 and through some other stuff, which I think we do this in some other places in, in this uh, text today, um, but he's talking about his return, his second coming, and he's they're they're connecting the two there, the end of age and the second coming, as the second coming is kind of the trigger of the end of the age. So there's a new age that's kind of beginning. What's most believed about the current age that we're living in? is that this is where Satan is ruling. The coming age is where Satan, where Jesus is going to rule. So that's when you hear the end of an age, it's kind of like Jesus is coming to rule on earth, okay, during a time period that's called the millennial reign. We'll talk about that more in the future. But this end of age, it's the end of this current age is what that is. And, and we're, the thing that, like if you were looking at a timeline, the thing that's going to kind of put a dot at the end of this age is the second is the return of of Jesus, the second coming of Christ? Okay, that's what that scripture is kind of locking in on for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. so I always, keep, always thought it was like the end of the age of where, um, like when Jesus, like we came to an age when he allowed the Gentiles to be a part of the. I'm sorry. The Gentiles, whenever um, the Gospels opened up to them, right, and and I always thought it was that age that I thought that was the age he was it's, referring to. This though, this though he's saying, and this is why I wanted to call the scripture out. But it's, tell us when when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world or the end of the age? So the term end of the age that you hear in scripture periodically or when you hear people talking about in, in times. Now, could there have been another age of some sort? I don't, I'm not sure about that. But when you're starting to hear about futuristic end of age or when is that, it's tied to that point. So there's kind of like that timeline, Jesus returns end of an age. And now a new age is beginning. Okay. Okay. Next one, let's go to Matthew 13. Let's back up a little bit. There's a parable there that I want to go through. This is a parable that I think oftentimes, um, it's the parable of the weeds, but I think it's important to understand this one because um, I've actually heard this one multiple times refer, being referred back like during um, like when people talk about rapture. But... It's interesting when you hear about it because it doesn't align with what the rapture perspective is. And so I thought this was a good one to go through because I think uh, because of how it relates. So Matthew 13, and, that, and it's actually verse 24 through 30 is the actual parable. So let's read that first. So who wants to read the parable itself? Did you see it was Matthew what? 13, 13 24 verse 24 through 30. Okay. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, Any enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do what us to go and gather them. But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together with the harvest, and a harvest time I will let the reapers. 
Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, so if we sum that up, what's gone on here? We've got a field, somebody has sown a bunch of nice wheat, and some bad guy came along and took a bunch of weed seeds and uh, just splattered them through the field, right? So now stuff's starting to come up and they're like, no, wait a second, that is not wheat. You know, this is some kind of nasty weed. What happened? You know, and they were, the workers were kind of like, hey, well, let's pluck them out now and let's get rid of them. And he's like, no, 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 because if you do that, you're going you're gonna to disturb the roots. These things are, we're going to kill all the weeds as well. Not a good thing, right? And so what happens at the end? He lets them all grow up together. And then at harvest time, okay, and harvest time is a key thing we're going to read about in the end here. At harvest time, what does he do is he goes and he first, goes and gets all of the weeds. So he goes and plucks the bad out, not the good. That's, that's where a lot of people have referred to this as a rapture scripture, but the concept of the rapture that you hear about people talking about is that the Christians are evacuated, right? Um, but this isn't the Christians evacuated, this is the bad guys that are getting taken up first. And they're getting up, they're pulled up, bound up, thrown into the fire, and then the, the rest of the grain goes into the storehouse. Okay. Now, the, now in this one, this is one of the parables which we're, we're fortunate to get a glimpse into what Jesus says it actually means. So if we fast forward a little bit to verse 36, verse 36 through 43, this actually talks about what is what. So it brings a little more clarity to what's going on here. So then, leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. The disciples said, Please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. First question, who's the Son of Man? Jesus. Very good. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. So who's the people of the kingdom? God's children. God's children. So this is the world. Jesus is the Jesus planted the seeds into the world, and the world is God's children. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. So the devil's the guy who sold all the bad seed, and all of the plants, those weeds, those are the unsaved. Mm -hmm. The harvest is the end of the age, end of the world. That's the reason I wanted you to, I wanted this uh, other scripture to be ref referenced up front because this is that futuristic end of the age that Jesus is talking about, okay? And so he says, the harvest is the end of the age, which is the second coming of Christ, and the harvesters are the angels. So, at the end of the age, so when Jesus comes back, the second coming of Christ, what's going to happen is he's going to come back and the, the angels are going to pick up on verse 40. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all, all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteousness will shine like the sun in the Father's kingdom. Anyone who has a ear should, should listen and understand. If you don't need more, more motivation for understanding end times, how about Jesus, is correct? Jesus Christ himself says, if you've got ears, and everybody's got ears, you should hear and understand. <laughs> so he's telling us we've got to understand this stuff. Okay? Anyway, point being there, though, is... is I want you to remember what just happened there. I've got a couple summarizations here. Weeds are gathered first. That's a, that's a significant thing there. They're bound and then thrown into the fire before the weed is gathered. Okay? The harvest is the end of the age. That's the second coming of Christ. And then what, he, what is he doing? He's removing all evil from the world, the, the world here. He's removing all of that. And he's taking... He's taken the... What did he throw into the fire here? The weeds. Right. He's not throwing the devil into the fire, but he's throwing the weeds into the fire. The unsaved. 
that's a very important, un, that's a very, that's like a um, linchpin here. Because you're going to see additional scriptures talking about the fire, what's being thrown into the fire at the second coming of Christ, is all the people that aren't saved. Wait, so... But not the devil, is that what you're saying? Huh? But not the devil? Now, I'm, I'm sorry, let me clarify one thing. The, the end of the age, the fi the all the people of the devil, the devil's not locked up initially. Or he's locked up, he's not thrown into the lake of fire initially. Okay. We're going to read about that in Revelation, so if you pause that for a minute. But what I'm trying to point out here is, is that the the people... The people that are on the earth, the evil, are going to be thrown into the fire, the lake of fire. Okay? The bad folks are. So, if, and, if that's, is that the second coming? The, the beginning of the end of the age is at the second coming. Okay. But there's an end of the age. This is the one point that, and, and I, I know I'm starting, and I can feel like I'm starting to confuse somebody. The end of the age. What, one of the things I found is that you see scripture that links to when the, the end of age to the second coming of Christ. Second coming of Christ is an event. Okay. End of the age almost seems like when you start reading different scriptures about it, it almost seems like it's a uh, it's the end of an age. And so it's like a like maybe it doesn't all happen all simultaneously because there's aspects of it that other scriptures talk about happening like after the millennial reign. And it's referred to in a similar sense. Okay, so um, you, let's keep going just a little bit. Okay, yeah. It's tied to the second coming, though. That's the key point. Okay. And this parable is specifically talking about this harvest of the evil and the, all the people on the earth that are evil is at the end of the, end of the age. Okay. okay. So do you think that's at the end of tribulation? That this time period yes. is at the end of tribulation? I think that the... And I think we're going to find more scriptures to support this. That the second coming is absolutely at the end of the great tribulation. There's very conclusive evidence of that. The end of the age is like in the great tribulation, but like leading up to the second coming. Uh, the end of the age starts at the second coming. Oh, okay, okay. It starts at the second coming. Now the question is: This is the part that I'm not totally comfortable saying. What is that? Some of the events I'll show you. I'll show you a couple of them here in the end of the age, that term is used, and there's also this, uh, but there's some events that you can hear happen later after the millennial reign, but yet the end of the age started when the second coming begins, which the millennial reign starts then. So you hear something almost as if like that term is kind of used to describe stuff that's happening, like in a general sense, that's happening after Jesus arrives, but not like Pop, 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 events, event, 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 event. It would get a little more clear, but that was the one thing when I was doing this study and pulling all this together that wasn't totally, I couldn't just totally definitively say it's this. What I could say is the end of the age that's being referred to is definitely tied to the second coming of Christ. And what I could definitively say here is, is that this parable is definitely talking about uh, evil people being taken up. It's not talking about good people being taken up, which, so it's kind of like if, if somebody was using this to say, this is a scripture that I think backs up why the, why a, um, the concept of a rapture occurs, it's not. It's, it's the other way around. Is this so, okay. and, you, and you're going to hear one more scripture a little bit later about people getting thrown into the lake of fire, hell, um, the bad guys. And so, but if you're, Let's hear that a little bit later. Is this the, the, the first coming, the second coming, when Jesus comes back with the, the his people behind him? Are you talking about this is the second coming? No. There's only, there's only one second coming of Christ but that's, that's talked about in the Bible, and that's this. But that's when Jesus comes back on a horse with all his... Right. That's the second coming, right? That is the second coming of Christ. Okay. We'll so read, some, we'll read scriptures to right kind of support here. that. You're talking about what that's what that is. Well, what I'm saying is, that's why, I, that's why I'm saying, when it comes to the end of the age, this is a descriptive, descriptive of what happens at the end of the age. 
Okay, that's what we saw in verse. Um, So it will be at the end of the age, verse 40. So this is a descriptive of, verse, verse 40 is a descriptive of the end of the age. So this parable is about the end of the age. Okay? And in Matthew 24, 3, when we read that, the disciples were asking, when are you returning and the end of the age beginning? That's, what he, that's kind of what they said in 24, 3. So what I can say between the two is that second coming of Christ is the beginning of the end of the age, and this happens in the end of the age. That's so, about the about the best of locking it in that I can that, right now. Then that's the end. That's when everything starts happening. That's definitely yes. That's a true statement, and that and there's definitely except the tribulation stuff. Yeah. So, okay. But that's a, that's a definitive, and the begin and it's the beginning of the end of the age. I'm just not 100 percent sure. I'm not 100 percent confident in saying. Is the end of the age? How's it being used in the Bible? Because it almost sometimes seems to refer to the the time when Jesus, you know, when the the devils kind of got domain on the earth, and when it he gets that taken away from him, kind of indicates that. Then other things kind of indicate that it's like this period, this kind of final transformation that's going to occur. You know, like that, like we know that people are going to. Uh, um, well, let's keep reading because I'm afraid I'm gonna, I'll tell you the whole story. In the right day. now we're having a civil war. When he comes back, we're going to have a full-fledged war. Yeah, there, there will be a there will be a war. Yeah. They won't have to a choice. I'm not just saying it though. If if you're taking all the evil off of off of the earth, off the earth, then you're going to have nothing but nice people. There's not going to be no more evil, or would the devil still be able to tempt the people that are on the earth still? We're going to get to that in the future. Yeah, that's different. So hang on to that. Okay, and I got one more question, because okay. I'm really confused. Okay, good. Um, the next question, I guess I got the movie in my head. Yeah. Is there ever going to become a time for those that are, if you're already taking these people and putting them in the fire, the sinners, what about, like, in the movie where, oh, I'm going to chop your baby's head off if you don't choose God the beast. or at least exactly so we're going to talk about the mark of the beast that's in the great tribulation okay this is after the great tribulation you're going to see that in the word this wow. is after the memorial I'm just saying this I'm going to show you I, uh, I'm going to show you what I'm going to just show you what the scripture is showing okay, okay? you guys again you draw your own conclusions because I'm not going to try to Tell you on anything. No, I'm not. I'm I'm we're we're going to read the scriptures together. Just, yeah. You know, and, and every time I say some statement like that, I realize, like, there's a, a you know, if you read Left Behind for one, you know, in, in the Left Behind series, it supports the concept of the rapture, which occurs pre tribulation. But that's, I'm jumping ahead and I'm saying these statements without any support because the supports in what our materials are going to go through. Mm -hmm. And I really want you to hear the scripture. And I want you to draw your own conclusion. That's how I've gotten my, what I'm going through and walking you through. My beliefs have changed. When I was a young kid, I 100% believed one way. I believe different now. But it's because I read the scriptures and, the, and they don't line up with what I was taught. And so well, you guys may that. find the same thing. I'm and it's that certainly same gonna it's right certainly now. gonna shoot arrows through a lot of the movies that we've seen, books right. we've read. Um, potentially teachings that we've had. There's so the second coming, because I'm not, I can't see your board, but the second coming is definitely before the tribulation or everything. No. No. After. Oh. It's after the tribulation. Like right here at the end. And that's what I want you to see the scriptures that tells okay. us why. Why that? I want you to read the scriptures yourself. Okay. That one parable. That's the first time I've ever realize I mean I've read that before but I must have skimmed read it because that's the first time I've ever realized that but that's that like they took out the evil. Yes, and that's real that's first. very important to understand yeah, about that's that parable. The first time I've ever seen that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know it's always there but that mm -hmm. then my mind goes I've heard that before but never put two and two together like that. Okay. So like I said <laughs> I know this is gonna I mean, first in our bubble. I, I know that this is like <laughs> A lot of this is going to be like, well, 
But that's why it's like, we're going to read the scripture and then you guys can come to your own conclusions. I'm going to highlight some things that stood out to me, but you can, you can have your own conclusions. Okay, the first coming of Christ, um, you know, Jesus, when he came, he came to pay, pay the price for our sin. The second coming of Christ, though, is to save his people. Okay, we are living in a sinful world, we all know it. We see it all around us all the time, we're so frustrated, you know. Um, he's coming to save us, that's the key. And Hebrews 9.28 talks about that. Um, the other thing is, Revelation 1.7, I'm going to hop that one right now, because we read at the beginning, back in Acts 1.11, remember when the angels said, just as he came, just as he left, and, and, and it said there, it said that, you know, the disciples were eagerly trying to see him, they were looking, you know, they're like, I think I still see, you know, in the cloud. Well, let's read Revelation 1 7, because this is when Jesus is coming. Um, I think it was, yeah. Revelation 1 7 is referring to when he comes back, the second coming. So, Revelation 1 7. Who's got that? Okay. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, every one who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So, the points I want to highlight there, he comes, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him. Those are very important pieces um, in the nations of the world, obviously, are going to be mourning. They're going to be happy to see him. You know, because the devil's kind of convinced the world in the Great Tribulation that God is not the right way. Yeah. Okay? That's where we get into the, the, the Antichrist versus all the other Antichrists that are all over the place. But, um, so, like, to, I, I was reading uh, one, 1 John 5, I think it's Antichrist or something like that. And it was saying there's going to be multiple ones, but is there going to be a leader of one? There's somebody that um, we, we'll, we're, we're going to talk about in here pretty soon. Um, hopefully we'll get to it today, but Beast 1. There's, when, when we talk in Revelation, we, you'll hear Beast 1, Beast 2. Okay. Beast 2 is false prophet. Beast 1 is often referred to as the Antichrist. That's the big one. Okay. That's the guy who's kind of really leading and deceiving the nations. Okay. And, and totally powered by the, de the dragon or the devil. Okay. So we'll, we'll get to the scriptures on that. Okay, so he's going to be very visible. Everybody's going to see him. He's going to come in the clouds. That's the key I wanted to point out. That ties us back to that Acts chapter 1, verse 11. There's your connection. Okay? And that is his, that's Christ's return. we got to be ready, and we got to eagerly await him. That's our job. If you don't get anything out of this, that's the one thing, because that's directly applicable to us. We need to... We cannot get so distracted with the world around us and the things that are going on in life in general that we don't eagerly wait for him. He wants us to be waiting for him. You've heard of the parable of the, uh, uh, the virgins with the uh, oil? You know, and, and some of them are ready. They're, they got their, their little stock, their oil lamp thing is full and they're ready to roll. And when the bridegroom comes back, you know, they're like, let's go. You know, some of them are like, oh, darn, I forgot to get the oil. Got so distracted with everything and watching Netflix, you know. Forgot my oil. And uh, and then what happens is the bridegroom goes and takes them. They go around and get their oil. They try to come back and they're knocking and they can't get it. And that's what Jesus is telling us. It's like, pay attention. You need to have conversations about this. You need to anticipate this. We need to be thinking about him coming back. Like, that's, a, that's like super important. So I'm not um, even tell. I'm tell Jesus. I'm watching for you. I'm looking for you. And you know, because it's really the truth is you. Everything that goes on around you. Some people say you're just getting paranoid, but I look at it as just a sign of His coming because I am looking for Him. You keep, know. Keep it to be a part of the conversation. Yeah, and now most people won't talk about it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Most people don't want to talk. No. Because they don't no. want. To when you try to talk about it or try to get ideas or what do you think about, you know, this, is this the time, is this the time? Right. Yeah. People just, no, they won't talk about it at all. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what we are supposed to in Titus 2, 11 through 13, let's go over there real quick. That talks about, and so does Matthew 24, 44, both of these talk about um, 
the importance of this. So Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. Chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. It says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures, similar to what you said, Mom. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we, and here's the first part of it, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave us life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. So we're supposed to be looking forward to and waiting for him to return. Matthew 24, 44 says something similar. Actually, my sister-in-law says I'm eight up. Eight up? Eight up. Yeah, because, you know, I have a question. Uh-huh. <laughs> eight up. Who wants to read Matthew 24, 44? Therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So like, that's the other thing. It's going to be a complete surprise when it happens. Like, it's just totally in, in the... He's talking about before, but he's like, talking about if a burglar comes to break into a house. If you knew when the burglar was going to come, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to break in. You know? But when burglaries happen and they actually successfully happen, it's usually because we ain't got a clue. We totally let our guard down in most cases. And God's saying here, no, you got to be ready because the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to come when you least expect it. So, which brings us to the question why is it important that we be ready and not lose focus? Why do you think God just warns us like that? Jesus Himself warns us like that so much. Why is that important? Be ready and what? Don't lose focus. So, be focused, think about, be ready, eagerly anticipate. Because it's probably easy to fall back in the sin. I don't know. I think. I you, think could, you could get caught up in the world for sure. Yeah. You know, I got time. I think really, I mean, he knows when he's coming back, so he knows the times. Only God does. Right. Yeah, but I mean. God's Father. Yeah. Jesus doesn't even know. I'm sure Jesus might have a hint of the error. Well, he says specifically, we're going to talk about that. I know he don't know. He specifically says he does not even know. I know he says that. Okay, but anyway, let's read that part. But Jesus. you need to stay focused, I think. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, just saying, just saying, just saying well, <laughs> time, time, right, like, as time goes on, yeah. life gets so crazy that you don't even hardly know what day it is. I don't, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't have a job or something, I don't know what day it is. I don't even know what evening it is happening. But I mean, I think that if you if you're not careful, you're going to lose focus because there's so much out there in the world. You're so busy, you know. Something's always going on. I just think that's why he says that because he knows as time goes on, if you're not careful, you're going to get caught up in all the worldly things right. that they're. You well, know, I think saying. that's my greatest fear is that I'll be deceived. Mm-hmm. Mom, mom is often saying that as well. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think for me it's always been because I am older, and well, you and I, I'm so old to be right. I don't and know. I we talked about this one day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, when you're older like that, and you've been taught, like I've been taught about the rapture and all that, that's not easy to let go of because you have been preached that. The difference now that I'm doing is reading it for myself more. Where I used to listen, read it with them, not pay much attention. Now I'm getting where I am. You know, like that one scripture, I had never really seen that. So I think that's part of it. But I think it's because of the busyness and the 
things that go on that is why it would be easy to what, what other thing do you think might be coming into play I, here? I think he wants us to be as giddy as a bride, excited, yeah. anticipating that time. Mm -hmm. He wants us, because we are the bride. He wants us, well, we all know how brides are that day. I mean, they're just like little schoolgirls, you know. And I think that's, he wants us anticipating to be with him. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, right? I wonder also if he doesn't want us to think about that often and be mind have, when he talks about being heavenly minded, I sometimes wonder if he doesn't want us to be thinking about that so that we realize the our our goal when he left was he told us go out, make disciples, teach them what I've taught you, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if we start to lose sight of this, yeah, we might fall away, but also, we're going to, we won't have the fire burning underneath us of the realization of, you know, do you really want your best friend that doesn't go to church or doesn't, you know, doesn't have a relationship with God? Do you really want him to go in hell, into hell for eternity? You know, or do you really want, you know, that coworker that is the sweetest person on the earth, you know, but they're um, Hindu and they believe 100% in that religion? Do you really want them, do you want God to come back and for them to be left, you know? It's like, and I think that's also part of the reason why he actually, I think what you guys said is, is part of the reason, and I think also keeps our focus, keeps us realizing this is, earth, it's going to happen when we don't know it, you know? So. Yeah. Tell you what, let's take a, uh, couple minute break. Let's try to get back by 7.15. So, when will Christ return? Short answer, who knows? God. I said nobody knows. Actually, God knows. Only God knows. Um, and that's God the Father, by the way. So, in some scriptures here that uh, support that, Matthew 25, 13 says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Let's go ahead and just go to him. I think it's better. I think that's Jesus speaking. But not possible. And then Mark, the, Mom, the reason we kept saying that about Jesus doesn't know is because of the next one, Mark. So Matthew 25, verse 13. Yeah, so that's Jesus speaking. You too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. And then Mark chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 32 and 33. Mom, you want to read that one? Oh, I don't have it yet, unless you want me to read it off here. I'll read it. I got it. Right, go. go. All right. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Thank you, Brady. Keep awake. Do you want me to read? Or is that um, it? Was that being the 33? Yeah. Okay. okay. No, that's good. So, and he's talking about the coming of the Son of Man. So, we don't know, the angels don't know, um, God the Father knows, the Son doesn't know. That's it. So that's the reason, timeline-wise, for us to try to predict when he's coming back, you know, we just don't know. Uh, but even though we don't know when he's going to come back, he gives a lot of he gives a lot of scripture describing precursors to his return, and that's what we're going to start to dig into. Um, so 
I want us to read a couple chunks of script, scripture that all talk about um, events that are going to occur. This, these are all the gospel accounts of Jesus talking about when he's going to return. And I want to um, highlight a few ones that kind of stick out that are common in all of those. And think about, just as you're thinking about it, think about, like, have the, has this occurred already or not? You know, because part of, we don't know when he's going to return, but he's saying eagerly await us, we await him returning. So part of that means that we should be always thinking about what's what's happened has it happened or not at this point in time you know like when we start to see all these things starting to get knocked out then we know we're getting pretty close to what's going on when they haven't happened we know that there's there's still there's things that have to be done what's yeah that, what's the name of that guy that wrote his book is it jonathan Collins? Mm -hmm. yeah he's really interesting he's got a couple of books out that uses scripture to show um, things that correlate to what you're just talking about. It's really, uh, oh. yeah. Did he write the book? Um, oh, gosh. I think I got a book of this right now. That one you found me, me the one day about the... Oh, forget it. Oh, he's written The Harbinger. Oh, that. Yeah. That. That I have a book. Harbinger, I've read that right Harbinger too. Yeah, I've read yeah. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I haven't finished it yet, but it's good so far. Mark 13, let's okay. go that one first. <laughs> Mark 13, 3 through 27. It's a bit of a chunk. Um, I'm going to probably just kind of like ding, ding, ding on a couple things to, to highlight a few things as we go through here. Mark 13, chapter 3 through 27. He's got some good breath because this is a, this is a little bit of a run. <laughs> Anyone? I'll try. Okay. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Okay, pause for a second. One of the things I want to just highlight here is it says, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. So that's one thing you can kind of just pick up. I don't know if anyone reads Frank Peretti books, uh, but he had a book called um, um, it, was, it was a orange book that it like was flames or something all over. It was about this guy who showed up and they were kind of wondering if he was Jesus because he was like making bread out of nothing. Remember that book? I haven't read that. Oh gosh, I wish I could remember the name who, of it. Who did that, Frank Peretti? Frank Peretti. Was it called the Prophet? No, he's not, one called yeah, the it's not the prophet. We'll find it here just in a minute. But in that book, one of the things I thought was interesting is somebody shows up on the scene and, and uh, is doing a lot of miraculous things and people started to begin to wonder if he was the Messiah. And it's like, there's scripture already clear as to how he was going to come back. Yeah. Everybody's going to see he's coming out of the clouds or something like that. So that's, a, that's kind of a beginning, you know, don't let anyone mislead you. That's kind of given us some straight up, definition as to how he is coming back. He's not he's not gonna be returning and right. doing a ministry or something. There was a series on Netflix called The Prophet. Visitation. And it chose Visitation is what it, that book's called. Oh yeah. Visiting. And he comes down in a in a tornado. Yeah. <laughs> <Tornado>. Yeah. <laughs> so just just so you know, I just wanted to highlight that. It's like he warns us don't be deceived. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to think I mean if somebody just shows up and is doing miraculous things stuff, he's not God. It's not Jesus. It's not, that's not part of the plan. When you really think about it, it says, or earlier we read that um, many will say like that I am, like they're Jesus and stuff. Like they are the Messiah. Well, a thousand five hundred years ago, yeah, a thousand five hundred years ago, Muhammad, was Muhammad said, I'm, no, I'm the Messiah. Did um, he? I don't know. I don't yeah, know like he thought that. he was 
He's not a god. So, I mean, yeah, so I mean, it's like that? No, he's not. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, um, uh, lost my train of thought, but just keep that in mind. It's like we know what it's going to look like when he comes back, and yeah. that should really. Go ahead and pick up. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be there will be earthquakes in various places, there will be famines. This is all but the beginning of the sufferings. But take heed to yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them. Okay. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Okay, pause for a minute. So I want you, to, like I was saying, I want us to ask these questions. Has this already occurred or is this a future event? So could have, could there be, when it talked about back up in um, verse 7, uh, you'll hear, hear wars, threats of wars, but don't panic. Could that have possibly happened or not? Yeah, it could possibly happen. Could be. Yeah. Especially from a Jer for Jerusalem perspective, yeah, that place has been really beaten up. Um, what about um, uh, nation will war? Nation will war go to war against nations. Could that have happened or not? Yeah. Could have? Maybe not. Yeah. Right. We had World War One, World War Two. I mean, that's about the whole world. Um, have there been famines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that could have, could not. We don't know. Um, these are all the first birth pains. Um, uh, you'll be handed birth pains is what my mind calls it out as. You'll be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. Well, that, are, that absolutely are happened at least to the the people that were beginning the whole Christianity, and it continues to happen today yeah. in other worlds, right? So that's definitely happening. You're going to stand trial before governors and kings because you're my followers. Yeah. Absolutely. And as we read more about the Great Tribulation, we'll hear even more about that kind of stuff. Um, so now, uh, keep going. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Okay, pause for a second. I missed one that you read in the previous time, but verse 10, for the good news must first be preached to all nations. So has that happened or not happened? Well, I'm mean, not sure about that. I think that's because there was the time where, like, I guess, I don't know if people are over here in the United States or not. I mean, you can't really believe what science says, but you hear people over in Europe, I guess you call it, and then, and then everyone moved over to America. I guess that was, like, another nation, like, to the ends of the earth. That's what, that's what I think of which just says, like, to the ends of the earth and stuff like that. And the question is, though, is there any place on earth that is totally untouched by the gospel? Period. I don't know. If, I, I think I don't they, know. I, I do think it's certain really. islands or something that were. But then we just hear about where the one. I don't know. I read it or something. Where like somebody was killed trying to reach this one island, and they were they were. The natives and they, they were killed the as soon as the airplane. Yeah. 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 That's the end of the spear movie, but. Um, but the point is, is it, could, it we could be getting there or not. But oh. being that now we have the ability to go anywhere on Earth pretty easily, Plus you know that was only within the last hundred years for sure. You know, technology has allowed us to get to everywhere. We the question is, have we? This uh, documentary on a place in uh, the Amazon, and they still go by all of their tribal rules. But what Tom and I thought was so funny was they had cell phones. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so anyway, that one may or may not have happened. About the uh, people being betrayed and fathers, you know, uh, betraying their own child, children rebelling against parents. I mean, we've seen those kinds of things for sure. Yeah. And even in the 
at the, in a way, some of the Jews did that to their own people. Um, and everyone will hate you because you're my followers. Again, definitely has been happening for quite some time. So now number 14, verse 14. But when you see the desol desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop <coughs> go down, nor enter his house to take anything away. And let him who is in the field not turn back to take the mantle. Okay, pause for just a second. So, um, so th this is said another way. You hear this oftentimes referred to the desecration that causes abomination. <coughs> Um, and so this is referring to that. We're going to hear more about that. The day is coming when you, verse 14, the day is coming when you will see the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing where he should not be. So remember that later when we talk more about it, but that's the desecration. Or, what is that what the Antichrist? It, it basically, it's kind of like, uh, it, we'll read more specifically about it, but it's essentially the... Um, uh, the, the, the Antichrist guy is kind of setting up his reign from the temple. Yeah. And he's des desecrating that temple. Right. And that's part, that, when you get to that part, you're now in a very definitive a num number of years kind of to go. Yeah. Okay. Now there are some people that we're talking about, like uh, Nero and some of the other folks, when they were doing some of the things they've done back in the Roman days, that, that could be this. Um, that is a that is a belief out there. I'm just telling you that um, it seems to me more like a futuristic event because of the way that it's going to be, the way it's tied to the other things that are around the in the Great Tribulation, and that that part is occurring in there. Because this sounds like more like one major thing where a long time ago when they did it, they did that a lot of times in for you know going to destroy yeah. all these right. buildings and you know. All the different things, but this sounds like one. this is a special event, mm -hmm. and uh, Daniel talks about it as well as uh, here. I don't know if you pick it up on it, but verse 17. Um, we just talked about this earlier when Jesus was crucified, and, and he's walking to the to the, um, the to, to be put on the cross. Verse 17. If you want to pick up. And alas for those who are with child, and for those who give suck in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation, which God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not shortened the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Okay, so, so that kind of, he's shortened the days, there's so much, basically it's like if he doesn't shorten it, then nobody's going to survive it. it. That's how bad it gets. Probably hasn't happened, is what I'm thinking. Yeah. What does it mean by, when it says, um, what did it say? Never mind, wait. For there will be great anguish in those days and any time. And then it says stuff about praise, tribulation, Herbert. It's, it's a, that's a ref, it, this is referring to the Great Tribulation. He's, okay. he's, he's saying that the Great Tribulation gets so bad, it's the worst that the world will ever get. Okay. And, and it will never get that bad again. Okay. Like so it's if you if you if you kinda have a uh, graph of time and uh, how bad it can get. Yeah. If that were your graph, it's like tribulation goes like this and it goes down like this. It's like there's this hump where it gets so yeah. bad that God says, I'm putting an end to that. Because if I don't, everybody's going to fall away. So, okay. Verse 21, we're going to keep going here through 31, or 27. Six more, seven more. And then if anyone says to you, look, there is the Christ, or Look, there he is. Do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to lead astray. 
if possible, the elect. But take heed, I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Okay. So some things to kind of highlight in there. Um, notice that the great tribulation it's like in worse, 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 worse. And then he says there, then the Son of God's gonna come back. Okay. It's getting so bad, he's like, I'm putting an end to this. And God's like, Jesus, go. It's time. And, uh, but just before that, it's like, anguish is going to be so bad. Some things to highlight in here, all these false prophets, false messiahs coming up, the Antichrist, the big Antichrist and all that. Um, the uh, sun's going to be darkened, the moon's going to give no light, stars are going to be falling from the sky, powers in the heaven are going to be shaken. Those are, you know, if we, if we think about it, these are kind of the major things in, in the, the notes I kind of got them highlighted, but the gospel is going to be preached every, everywhere. The um, great tribulation is going to have occurred. That's what we just read there. False prophet is going to be performing miraculous signs. That is verse 22. Um, heavenly bodies are going to be, you know, the sun are going to be messed up. Sun getting dark and moon getting dark and stars falling out of the sky, all that kind of stuff. Those are all things that are common in each of these different gospels. Um, let's go to Matthew 24, 3 through 31. I think I'm going in lieu of time. Um, let's read uh remark. Let's go ahead and read it. Matthew 24, 3 through 31. I won't interrupt you so much. Huh? Okay, I'll read it. Matthew 24, 3 through 31. But listen for the same kind of theme through this, okay? Because you're going to hear, you know, it's different gospels, so you're going to hear the same uh, time that Jesus is talking, recounted by another author. So verse 3, 24. Later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return in the end of the world, the end of the age? That's the verse we read earlier. Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. The nation will go to war against nation and the kingdom against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You're going to be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and, many and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet, this is what I was talking about, the uh, desolation part. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration, standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out, of, out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return, even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive. But it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Then if anyone tells you, 
look, here's the Messiah, or there he is. Well, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven in power, with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Okay, so um, the, the new thing I want to highlight here, so you heard that was kind of a repeat of this other stuff that we heard, but notice here it's talking about um, with a mighty blast of a trumpet, and then they're going to go and gather the chosen ones. Keep that to, in your thoughts, because we're going to hear more about a trumpet blast, in particular a seventh trumpet blast. So... So is this going to be, this going to be, I thought the end age was like pinpoint out of the, out the weeds, like out of the evil people. And they also going to pull out. The end of the age, the end of the age, that's part of that. But this again goes back to, I can't 100%, there was some, uncom I was uncomfortable a little bit with that. Is the end of the age, is it multiple ends of the age, or does it kind of span a period of time? Does just is he just talking about that it begins here? Okay. I still don't know that part. Yeah. But we do know that the weeds, the parable of the weeds, that part, because he's physically plucking them out of the earth, he's taking all the bad people out of the earth. That part is after the um, millennial reign. Okay, yeah. And we'll see that in scripture and other scriptures. Oh, so the weeds is part of after the, or part of the plane where? After, at the end of it, when, when he lets uh, Satan. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. So what we're talking about now is what we're in now, in the world, like now, at this time? Well, I mean, a lot of what we've read is probably a little bit into the future. Right, that's what I'm saying, though. But yeah, I mean, we're kind of trying to discern where we're at in this order of events right now. Like some has probably already happened in the then some of the future is but that's what we're doing like right in this time frame. We're that we're in this right now. Right now we're somewhere in this what we've been reading. Okay. Because Jesus is describing things that are going to be happening and that's why I was trying to get us as we were reading this, I was trying to get us to think about each of the different things. Could it have already happened? Or is it futuristic? So when he comes in the cloud, that's the second coming. Yes. Okay, I'm getting it. So when he comes, so the key is, is that first coming of Christ happened. We know that that was, right. and, and then he left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a point when he's going to come back, second coming. And what we just kind of tied together is that just before that, there's a whole bunch of things that happen. That's what we've been reading here. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of things that happen to to the point when he comes back. So he's up here, he's in heaven, he comes back. A whole bunch of things that have happened, and he just described a whole bunch of that because he's telling us, nobody knows when I'm going to come back, but I do know, I can tell you, there's some things that are going to happen here, and you need to know those so that you know, as you start to see these things come into fruit, you're knowing that it's getting really close to the time I'm coming back. So, so the world so we're trying is basically to, going to get a lot worse than what we are Oh, absolutely. And oh, yeah. now. Oh, absolutely. A whole lot worse. Wow. You know, it's, I think a lot of times we don't think it's so bad because we're not living in other countries. Some of the other countries are going through a lot of, you know, the tribulation, really. But I think eventually America is going to. Now, I will say that that is uh, that's something I've, uh, I've, you know, you hear different perspectives and commentaries on things. One, one perspective is that um, what's being described here may not be the entire earth right. being in that. Like, I've heard that. 
Okay, so I'm not saying there's truth or not to that, um, but that is, some people, are, that's their perspective is that maybe the, maybe some of these things that are being talked about are not going to be as traumatic for the entire earth, but maybe certain areas of the earth that it's going to happen more. So just, just be aware of that as far as comments from people out there. Plus, my mind says that we'll mourn when they see the Son of Man. That must be the ones that aren't ready. Well, that's the, that is because when we get when we read a little further, we're going to see that the that this Antichrist uh -huh. basically kind of he kind of he kind of becomes like the world leader, and so all your nations are kind of following him, and I mean they've chose to follow him, and now all of a sudden Jesus comes back and it's like he's putting an end to that. I, I, and I also thought that that meant when it says the world were mourn, it would be Christians who know um, others that aren't saved. Right. Well, that they did believe in God, but they chose to believe in Him so they could continue to do yeah. their business and to protect themselves. Probably. You know? I mean, if you took the mark of the beast, we're going to learn that if you take the mark of the beast, you've decided to follow the devil and yeah. coming out. And I don't know. I just don't maybe, know. Maybe somebody grew up in church, heard the whole story and everything and understood, and still but never, can, never chose him as their savior, and then all of a sudden they realize, oh my gosh, it all happened. Just, just like you yeah, said. Yeah, that would definitely so, cost some money. That is something most Christians that I've talked to that have fallen away or they're not, you know, they're not serving God or they've been in church, but they're not, is they think about the mark of the beast. Yeah. They always say, I don't want to ever take that mark of the beast, because they know what it says in there. So that's one good thing that maybe they stop thinking, you know. But as yeah. God's so, children, we all have a seal already, correct? We have this seal on our foreheads. Right. So but even still, as somebody who, who feels they have fallen away, well, they've taken the mark of the beast. Even yeah. if he's, they got God's seal in Would they? I can't see somebody who really has the seal of the Lord would really take the mark of the beast. Can you? You're saying you can't see a person who's been saved and filled with the Holy Spirit is turning their allegiance to get away from God and falling away. Yeah. And that goes into, uh, remember we talked about Hebrews 4, 6 or 6, 4, talking about those who are once enlightened and it's impossible to restore them. Do you remember that scripture? We talked about it briefly in a past uh, thing, but it's that goes into the can you, are, is it once saved, always saved? Right. It kind of gets into that a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not going to be stolen from you, but could you decide to walk away from Christ? Could that be the, uh, could that be the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit concept that's un, unforgivable? Could be. I don't know. But that's the only, that's the only thing that if a person's saved, that's the only potential thing that could be. Well, I don't think it's to that something that, that, I know everybody's afraid of everything that happens. I mean, even I heard it about the shots and stuff like you're taking, maybe taking the mark and don't know it. I don't, I know, I really believe we'll know it if we're doing it. Yeah. No, I, mean, I think you'll know it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as people say a lot of times, well, I'm not going to take this, I'm not going to take that. But I think you're going to know because you're denying, you know, God, if, you know, before you do that. I don't think it's something that they're going to surprise you with, you know. But I do believe that someone that's been, you know, a Christian, but if you don't keep going forward and get into the work and just stay where you're, you know, I think you could be deceived. Everybody else is doing it. This is the only way you can get, you know, this or that or whatever. Because there may come a time that we don't, we can't get to the doctor, we can't do this, can't do that, because we don't have the mark, you know. Or even like, in my situation, when you're talking about oh, you're going kind of through all of this stuff here, my husband's not saved, so he might want to lean more towards following right. that, per you know what I'm saying, when I know the right way, you know what I'm and saying, it would be very and hard it would be really hard, hard. Yeah. you know, either he's got to follow me or he's got to go alone, you know, basically, because I'm not going to want to follow him, but he's going to go home. Um, I did have one question. So, what, something that I'm just stuck on, when you said that 
he's going to take all the sin out. You're talking the about bad the, people. At the beginning, when we were talking yeah. about the parable, yeah. So, that is after this? It's all after that. Okay. Because, so, I mean, those are the bad people. Because I'm thinking stuff. this is like the bad people, but when he's coming, showing himself in the cloud, it's not to take us up, though. It is. The, You'll see that later, too. So so you believe, believe that we'll go, that the elect will be in the tribulation as well? I mean, I know different people believe different things. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, okay. amillennialism. There's a, there's a number of different terms we're going to talk about in this, where we'll describe each of those different beliefs. Um, but that's where I want you to see what the scripture says about things. Yeah. You know, like like in this the, the gospels, it's important to see that what kind of precursors are there to his second coming. You know. I mean, you just, we just all read it. Mm -hmm. the, the Great Tribulation, he brings it to an end. Right. With his second coming. You know, it's not like it happens after. Not according to those scriptures we just read. So, yeah, I mean, so to answer your question, yes, but that's my belief. That's not what I was raised to believe, though. Well, but we'll talk about... Yeah, I listen to different people, and some, like, my, I know my okay. one son believes that we will be raptured before mm -hmm. the, the tribulation. But then I always tell him, but God tells us to be prepared too. Well, to me to be prepared, we would have to be prepared to live through that, to know what's coming. I don't know. Let's, let's keep okay. looking at more scripture because we're still on the light side on the scripture of okay. support. Let's keep looking though, but I want you guys to think about those. When we're reading the scriptures and we're drawing these conclusions, start to let that reform your thinking if your thinking doesn't align with the scripture. You know, if, if, you're, if we've read something or we've heard something or something from the past, but it's not lining up with the scripture, we need to dismiss what we learned in the past. And You want to align with the scripture. Mm -hmm. We don't want to walk out of here, well, yeah, the Bible says that, but I still believe this. Mm -hmm. That's not a good position to be in, and I've heard people say that. Um... So, out of the Gospels, I'm not going to read uh, Luke right now for sake of time, but I do want to just highlight so four things for sure that we saw. We, we highlighted them earlier. The Gospel is going to be preached to all nations. The great, the, the great Tribulation occurs. These are all precursors to the Second Coming of Christ. So the Great Tribulation occurs. False prophet performing miraculous signs. There's something about that. We're going to read Thess Thessalonians here in a moment. We're going to read more about that. Um... Heavenly bodies, weird stuff happens right towards the end of that. Sun gets dark, moon gets dark, all that. Okay, so those that's what we those are the bits of the precursors up to the second coming that we just read about the gospels. I want to hop over to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 10. And we're going to read that one though, that heavenly bodies, that would definitely give a that would be a sign that we definitely recognize. I think so. I mean, I really do. Stars start falling, and I mean, how would we not? Yeah. You know. Well, that's like how the world do you have that happen and not know what's going on? I got a feeling the Great Tribulation period is going to be that way. Second yeah. Thessalonians chapter two, and this is verse one through ten. This is kind of talking more about that man of lawlessness that we were talking about the uh, the desecration, abomination of, I keep forgetting the term, but that whole thing, um, this is a little more about that guy. So I want, that's why I thought it was important to read. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how he will be gathered and how we will be gathered to meet him. So this is the Christians talking now. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if, even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a, a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for the day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God. 
and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. I don't know if you remember what we just read, but part of the description of the tribulation was this desecration of the temple by this guy yeah. in the temple. Okay, There's a parallel in events here. Don't you remember, verse 5, don't you remember that I told you about all of this when I was back, when I was with you? And you know what I what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. An important part there is the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. So when Jesus comes, that's when he's going to be destroyed. That's a very important tie-in. That's, a, that's another one of the uh, yeah. links. Like, keep that in mind because that links some scripture that we're going to be reading in Revelation. When it talks about, you can, we're going to read them, but you're going to see how these events occur. And that's part of what happens is those two guys are thrown into hell when Jesus returns. Yeah. So this is a linchpin again. Verse 9, this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. And he will use every kind of evil to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. Okay? So, uh, that, that I thought was important because it's another one of those tie things together and it's another part of the scripture. So, one more, we're going to read Romans 11, 25 through 26, and then we're going to do a little bit of a summary of what we've got we've gotten through so far. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles come to Christ. And so all of Israel will be saved, as the scripture says. The one who rescues will come from Jerusalem, and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, that I will take away their sins. That's verse 27. But basically, all of Israel is going to end up being saved. That's what that scripture is saying. Before, that's something that's going to have to happen before. So where is Israel right now? Where? It's not where, like... Oh, uh, what? Yeah, are, they, yeah. are they all saved or not? Yeah. It doesn't seem that way because you've got all the, you still got the Jewish, all the different forms of Jewish stuff that haven't even acknowledged that the Messiah has come. Yeah, yeah. But it says he has the full number of the Gentiles, so there's only a certain amount of Gentiles, and then all the Jews get saved. Is that what it's saying? I don't want to say all the Jews get saved, but I, I will mean, say Israel. all of Israel will be saved. So I mean, you're talking about the Jewish nation, and I don't know what that means exactly. Yeah. I don't, but I know that it's, it, there has to be some big coming of yeah. the Israel nation to God, Jesus, and acknowledging salvation, like salvation, because yeah. they're, they're getting saved here. Yeah, they've always kind of acknowledged God, but they haven't acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. And in order to be saved, you've got to realize he did come and die for your sins. Right. You know, that's been, the big, that's been the big divide ever since uh, Christ first came on the scene, or first died for our sins, the big divide was they didn't believe, you know, the, the uh, Pharisees and all those guys did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So, Isn't that what the whole tribulation is about? Basically getting Israel to turn back towards God? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I wonder. That, that's a good question. Yeah. Something with the Mark of the Beast we were talking about earlier, you know, me personally, I don't, I'm not fully, as John, um, as John was saying earlier, 
like something like you don't have a lot of scripture to back it up. Like you don't put all your faith in like that. Like there's one thing that says like that. I don't like put my money on on that like verse. I connect all the verses, kind of how you were saying earlier. But personally, what I believe about the mark of the beast is I don't think it's a physical thing. Like something like that you get a tattoo or something like that because um, because I would think that if it's just where I believe like if the people that are like as Jesus says Jesus said like lukewarm then they would obviously if people say like I think Mark the Beast is basically like denying like Jesus I think the Antichrist would say like okay like come to me or you'll you will uh, die I think that's like the mark of the beast, like your choice of going. I'm going to throw one scripture at you, Revelation 24. Always. And we're going to hit that a little bit later. So it's, okay. we won't hit it today probably, but okay. Revelation 20, verse 4. Okay. But I thought it would have to be something physical because they say you can't buy or sell without it. They, so there has to be something that they identify as. Well. I watched something on the news recently. Where, I mean, because they always talk about how currency is going to lose its value. And if, if he goes in some stores, like, there's no change. There's, right. They're routed up to the nearest dollar, or, or, you know what I'm saying? But I read that there, there, yeah. there is a, a, a chip we'll that they're going to have, that. have, where, like, to go to a vending machine, all you have to do is. Oh, some in college your hand. students have that in some areas. They already have that. They yeah. open doors or anything. But like you, can, you put this chip and then you yeah. like to do uh, a vending machine, yeah. a soda. You just scan your hand. To me, that first thing I thought was, wow, that sounds like the mark of the beast to me. Yeah, we're getting ahead yeah. of ourselves okay. with the mark of the beast, okay? okay. <laughs> so we haven't hit that yet, and we are going to hit that first thing when we come back. Okay. Um, but I want to kind of solidify what we've got so far. Okay, scripture, you have to have a moment to hear that. Yeah, I was, I was completely wrong. It's that completely wrong. You can read it out loud. I'll, I'll read the last part of it. It okay. says, Norks, uh, they will have not worshipped, wait, hold on. They have not worshipped the beast on our statue. No except as marked on the foreheads or hands. So I think that changed my mind. So it does fall off that it's on your forehead or right hand. But um, so what we've got so far is you know, we talked a little bit about uh, prophecy in general, how you hold on to it, right? Because we, we are, when we're reading through the Gospels, I'm asking you the question, you know, did it happen, did it not, right? So you're kind of loosely kind of thinking about it a little bit. Um, you know, in terms of like where we at, like you can't, none of us should be able to walk out of here definitively and say, yes, that absolutely happened because it's, it's not that clear yet, right? But it will become clear. Um, second thing we talked about, there's been a first coming of Christ. There's going to be a second coming of Christ, one second coming of Christ. And when that second coming of Christ occurs, it's going to be visible to everybody. It's going to be in the clouds. It's going to be like when he left. And they were pretty descriptive about how he left. They saw him go up into the clouds. So he's going to come up and he's going to be seen by everybody. Okay? And then we don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know when the second coming is going to happen. But God has given us a lot of information of precursors up to the time of when it's going to happen. So what's going to happen is so it's like Jesus goes up and then he's going to come down. And when he comes down... God doesn't tell us when that time is, but he does tell us in the time before that, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see these series of events occur, and you will know it's about that time. Okay, so he's given us a lot of information on that. That's what we just kind of went through and read. Those things that, were, that we summarized that are here on the bottom of page 4, gospel is going to be preached to all nations. The great tribulation will have occurred because, again, he brings the great tribulation to an end with his second coming. The false prophet's going to perform a lot of miraculous signs, so much so he's going to be deceiving all the nations. They're all going to be following him, this false prophet. Well, really, the, the Antichrist. They're all going to be following the Antichrist. The false prophet's kind of his, his right-hand guy. When you mean by, like, do you mean like he's going to perform miracles? 
Mm -hmm. One of the miracles actually, uh, I don't remember if we get deep into it, but one of the miracles is like he literally uh, dies and he comes back to life, sort of. He has like a more, it says he has a mortal wound and comes back. Really? So a mortal wound. So that's going to be one of the things is like he's kind of like coming back to life, whether it really completely does or not, but it seems that way. And that's part of what establishes him as this, you know, and he's, he's able to call it um, He's just able to do a lot of miraculous signs. I don't know. By the devil. How many people were holding their breath when Kennedy got a shot? <laughs> Whether or not he was going to Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, false prophet coming on the scene performing a lot of miraculous signs. The heavenly body thing, like you were talking about, Mom. Moon darkened, sun darkened, and stalls starting to fall from the sky. Some big, major celestial thing is going to happen. Um, the man of lawlessness, this antichrist, that, that one antichrist. Um, he is going to have a serious rebellion. He is going to be just like in God's face. And he's going to do everything he can to just get in God's face. Um, and so much so he's going to go and set his own temple up, or his own throne and desecrate that temple um, over in Jerusalem. Okay? So he's going to set up his little house right there and, and rule from there and just desecrate it. Okay? And, uh, and then Israel will be saved. And you know who knows? You said about the tribulation. Maybe that's what brings them back. Maybe that does bring them back when when their nation just gets established as the the epi power for Satan himself. Yeah. You know, maybe. So anyway, those are those precursors, and those those precursors occur before the second coming of Christ. Next time, we are going to pick up with first. We're going to start delving into. From a different angle now, you've got a high level view of the things that happen in this, from, from the first coming to the second coming of Christ. Now we're going to start to squeeze ourselves in. We're going to squeeze specifically into the tribulation. And we're going to watch the Bible, because the Bible unfolds this very explicitly. We're going to, we're going to zoom into the tribulation, and we're going to watch what happens as the tribulation completes and we go into the wrath of God on the other side of that. That's where we're going to pick up on this, this next time. We're going to walk right over the, right through the tribulation and the second coming of Christ and the effect of him, what, he, what happens right thereafter when he comes back. Because there's, there's a lot, there's a whole lot of detail in Revelation right there. Yeah. And that's what we're going to focus on at the beginning of next time. Um, and then that will lead into the rest of it millennial reign and the final judgment and all that. So we've only really covered up here on this, this board, we've really only covered up to this point. We're going to really zoom in here and to here and, and this transition to there. And then we're going to come over to this thing. The first coming. And the next one. Then that's a great group of tribulation and the second. And then that leads into the moment. Yeah. Who would like to close us in prayer? that we have, God, that we will understand it, Lord. I pray that we will all go away and have it in our minds and maybe look up some of the scriptures again and just, Heavenly Father, really see, Lord Jesus, what the truth is. Lord, I thank you for everyone that's here. I pray that you give them a safe trip home. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that aren't here and pray that they'll be able to be here next week. And Father, for those, Heavenly Father, that are maybe watching them, through the videos, I just pray that you would bless them and they'll be able to see the truth also through everything that's being said. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 And the heat.